This is the polar vortex, a spinning mass of frigid air building up in the stratosphere since August, and it's on pace to absolutely wreck the northern hemisphere this winter. It has so far been kept at bay by a strong wind current known as the polar jet stream. But the jet stream is weakening, and there's evidence to suggest that it will weaken even more in the coming months, making the growing polar vortex collapse and unleashing a flood of frozen air in the US, Canada, Northern Europe, and Russia, the likes of which we've never seen before. I made a video about El Nino 2023 and I learned so much. In fact, we had a hurricane in San Diego. So this is really important. So just what's going on here and what exactly should we all expect this winter? Let's figure this out together. I'm Ricky and this is Tuba Da Vinci. This video is sponsored by Beam. When I first heard about the polar vortex collapse, I started digging to understand exactly what was going on and how it works. The polar vortex is a low pressure system that forms in the upper atmosphere above the troposphere where most of the weather happens. It is made of a large mass of very cold air that rotates counterclockwise around the North Pole and clockwise around the South Pole. These two vortices are surrounded by strong jet streams, which are bands of fast moving air that separate the cold polar air from the warmer air in the middle latitudes. Climatologists are talking about a possible collapse of the polar vortex, but what exactly does that mean? So it turns out it means that the large vortex over the North Pole can slow down and break down into smaller vortices and even change directions completely. This can have devastating effects on global weather patterns, particularly during winter, mostly affecting Canada and the US and to a lesser extent, Europe and Siberia. A couple of questions immediately popped up in my head. The first is why is this happening? Is this something new or has this happened before? And if so, how bad will it be this time around? My next question was, should we be worried? And what can we do to prepare? So let's dive in and start by looking for the answer to the first question. Why do climatologists say the polar vortex may collapse? After reading the first article on this topic, I immediately realized that I wouldn't be able to understand any of it without looking into how the polar vortex works in the first place and how it protects us from bone chilling winters. The answer I found is twofold. It's fascinating, right? I mean, when I research these videos, I lose all track of time, but as a content creator about to turn 40, I'm putting a lot more emphasis on good sleep. That's why I got myself a new bedtime routine that includes our sponsor this week, Beam, and this, their dream powder for better sleep. Blend one or two scoops of dream powder in a mug of hot water or milk, 35 to 45 minutes before you go to bed and enjoy deeper, better sleep. It comes in a CBD or non-CBD formulation, depending on your preferences and great flavors like chocolate, peanut butter, or cinnamon cocoa. It has awesome ingredients like reishi mushrooms, a superfood that helps support the body's sleep cycle and manage stress, magnesium, L-theanine, and melatonin, a compound that regulates the body's circadian rhythm, promoting restful sleep. It helps you fall asleep, stay asleep, wake up refreshed, and it tastes great with no added sugar with only 15 calories and it's gluten-free, dairy-free, vegan, non-GMO, and keto-friendly. For me, it's about once a month where my mind is firing so fast that I can't shut it down for good night's sleep. For my wife, it's about once a week. And I love the dream helps me sleep better and makes me feel good the next day. In a clinical study, 93% of participants reported Dream helped them get a better night's sleep and wake up feeling more refreshed. Click shopbeam.com slash Vinci or scan the QR code to shop the last few days of Beam's biggest sale and get up to 50% off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer. Huge thanks to Beam and you for supporting the show. First, there's a temperature and pressure difference between the equator and the poles. This difference creates a tendency for cold air to travel from the poles toward the equator at ground level and hot air to travel over the cold air in the opposite direction toward the poles. However, as it travels toward the equator, right around here, the cold air warms up before reaching the equator and begins to rise, getting sucked back up to the poles. This creates these two sorts of donut shaped swirls of wind called polar cells. Something similar happens with the hot air that rises near the equator and travels north in the upper atmosphere, forming two other donut shaped swirls called Hadley cells. Both the polar and Hadley cells tend to push cold air toward the equator near the surface. But what happens here? right between those two sets of cells. The air between 30 degrees and 60 degrees latitude is dragged by the polar and Hadley cells and forced to spin in the opposite direction like a gear connecting the two sets of cells. This forms a third set called the feral cells. But okay, why is all this important? What does it have to do with the polar vortex? This is where things get interesting. You see here in the feral cells, the air travels in the opposite direction to the polar cells, moving warm air toward the poles near the ground and cold air toward the equator on the upper atmosphere. This clash between the two streams of air is 
in part what keeps the cold air away from most of the northern hemisphere. However, there was one thing that didn't really make sense to me. I would expect the heavier, colder air moving south from the North Pole to simply slide beneath the hotter, lighter air and keep traveling south. So why doesn't that happen? I did a bit more digging and found out it's because of the Coriolis effect. I won't go into all the details here, but in short, the Coriolis effect is the way that objects or fluids seem to curve or bend when they move over or near the surface of the Earth toward the poles. This is caused by the difference in speed at different latitudes, which is zero at the poles and around a thousand miles per hour near the equator. So imagine you're standing on a spinning merry-go-round and you want to throw a ball to your friend who's sitting in the middle. If you throw the ball at a straight line, it won't go where you want it to go. It will seem to curve away from your friend. This is because you and your friend are moving at different speeds on the merry-go-round. This is exactly what happens with the feral cells. They're pushing hotter air toward the poles the same way you were throwing the ball to your friend at the center of the merry-go-round. To conserve angular momentum as it travels polewards, the air has to speed up to the east, bending its path. Eventually, it spins so fast that it stops moving poleward and creates a strong spinning current between the polar and feral cells. Wind speeds inside the jet stream can reach a staggering 250 miles an hour. That's 60% stronger than a category five hurricane. But this winter, that is about to change and the consequences will be pretty bad. We'll get to what happens when the polar vortex collapses in just a minute. First, let's find out what makes it collapse. The difference in temperature and pressure between the equator and the poles and the Coriolis effect are what cause polar jet streams. This jet stream, in turn, confines the freezing winds of the polar vortices above the poles. If the polar vortex collapses, it might be because the jet stream isn't strong enough to keep it contained. So why would this happen? If it's weaker, it must mean that the forces that cause the jet streams are weakening. We just saw that the Coriolis effect is a consequence of the speed of the Earth's rotation. The Earth always spins at roughly the same speed. That doesn't change during a polar vortex collapse, and the Coriolis effect doesn't change either. By the powers of deduction, that only leaves one option. The polar vortex can weaken and collapse if the temperature difference between the poles and the equator is reduced and the circulation becomes weaker or more erratic. This can make the wind patterns and the jet stream more wavy and unpredictable, instead of being a perfect line encircling the poles. The best analogy I can think of is a spinning top. When the top spins really fast, it's perfectly stable and all points of the surface rotate in a perfect circle. But as the spin gets slower and weaker, we start to see a little bit of wobble and it loses its balance until everything just comes crashing down. Something similar can happen to the polar vortex. For example, when a heat wave hits the stratospheric polar vortex, it can cause a major sudden stratospheric warming event, raising the atmosphere's temperature by as much as 50 degrees Celsius in just a few days. Once weakened, the vortex can buckle and even break apart into separate smaller vortices. It can even reverse direction or completely disappear. I'll show you some really mesmerizing footage from NASA showing this disruption in action in just a minute, so don't go anywhere. Anyway, when that happens, cold Arctic air can breach the polar jet stream and flood the land in mid-latitudes, which is where most of us live. The next question obviously has to be, has this happened before? It turns out that polar vortex collapses aren't actually rare at all. They happen pretty much every other year with varying intensity. But when they do, we usually get historic blizzards and record low temperatures across the board. Now, to be fair, there are many cold snaps during winter that have nothing to do with the polar vortex. Also, polar vortex disruptions don't always wreak havoc in the Northern Hemisphere as NASA researchers Lawrence Coy and Stephen Pawson, who specifically work on predicting major disruptions on the polar vortex, said in an interview. But some of the worst blizzards in US history have been linked to polar vortices. This is a table showing some of the strongest polar vortex related blizzards. The Great Blizzard of 1899 is on the top 10 list of the worst storms of US history. But what makes it unique is that it hit the hardest in Florida, Louisiana, and Washington DC. I found there have been many other collapses, but none are so revealing as the one that happened during December 2012 and January 2013 caused by a sudden stratospheric warming event. This footage is absolutely amazing. In mid-December, there is a beautiful, perfectly defined vortex over the North Pole. Then, near New Year's Day, a heat wave hits from the south, disrupting the spinning vortex. 
You can really see how everything breaks apart in early January and by February, the vortex has completely collapsed on itself, sending little vortices of cold air toward the US and Europe. This particular event caused a massive blizzard in the tri-state area, as well as colder than average winter weather in the UK. The 2012-2013 polar vortex collapse is what popularized polar vortices and made it cool in the mainstream media. The story would repeat itself that very year. The polar vortex would reform as we approach October 2013, strengthening and then breaking down again in early January 2014, leading to another record-breaking winter season. Okay, so now we know what causes the polar vortex to break down. We know that it's happened quite frequently in the past and that when it does, it unleashes snowmageddon on the mid-latitudes of the northern hemisphere. But what does the forecast look like for the foreseeable future? Now, forecasting weather patterns is an entire field of study, and I don't pretend to be a climatologist or meteorologist, so take everything with a grain of salt. What we can do, however, is look at the things that could trigger a polar vortex collapse and assess how likely it is that those conditions will happen this winter. The first thing we need for a polar vortex collapse is a polar vortex, right? Now, if you're probably thinking, don't we always have a polar vortex? Actually, no. During the summer times when the poles get too much sunlight and they're too warm, the air is just too weak to maintain a vortex. Polar vortices in the North Pole usually start forming in August and strengthen as winter arrives, reaching a peak strength in December when the stratospheric temperature is the lowest and the most dangerous. We found a weather report from last September 2023 confirming that a polar vortex was beginning to form over the North Pole and that it was rapidly strengthening. No weather model can accurately predict how this vortex will evolve until next January, but it is forming and it's getting stronger as stratospheric temperatures continue to drop. The red line here shows the temperature dropping from July to September. It's also pretty close to the blue line that represents stratospheric temperatures last year, which ultimately led to a vortex that collapsed in January, February 2023. The next question is, are there signs of potential disruptions this time around? We started looking for the most recent weather report for the polar vortex and found at least one report claiming a weak early disruption already underway in late October. This looks a lot like what happened last year. Later that season, a major warming event caused the vortex to collapse completely. I wanted to see if that particular vortex vortex collapse had any major effects on winter weather, so I started looking for reports of major blizzards during the first two months of the year. It turns out that it didn't hit us as hard here in the US, but it was felt really strongly in the UK. Even though the 2022-2023 winter season was the second warmest on record in Europe, the UK saw the season's coldest day on January 19th, reaching 5 degrees Fahrenheit, negative 15 degrees Celsius shortly after the sudden stratospheric warming event. That's not the lowest on record, but it's still really darn cold for a country where average winter weather ranges from two to seven degrees Celsius and rarely dip below zero. I was trying to figure out what could cause these sudden stratospheric warming events or SSWs and one thing kept popping up, El Nino. El Nino is a phenomenon that occurs when the surface waters of the Eastern Pacific Ocean become unusually warm, affecting the weather patterns and climate in the region and beyond. El Nino events happen irregularly every few years, usually around Christmas time, and can last for several months. El Nino can have significant impact on the ocean currents, fisheries, agriculture, and biodiversity of the affected areas, but it can also have far-reaching effect on the global climate because it sends out waves of unusually warm air toward the poles. I found that these heat waves were the culprits behind some of the SSW events we've seen. After digging a little bit deeper, I found that there is a strong correlation between the number of SSWs over the North Pole and El Nino events. The stronger the El Nino event, the stronger the heat wave and the stronger the stratospheric warming event. The stronger the stratospheric warming event, the more likely the polar vortex will collapse. On average, two out of three SSWs lead to a disruption of the polar vortex. So the key question then is how strong will this year's El Nino be? And spoiler alert, it's gonna be a beast. We made an entire video about El Nino a couple months ago, explaining why we thought this season's El Nino event is going to be particularly strong. If you haven't watched it, I highly recommend checking it out after this video. We are already in a confirmed El Nino phase of the ENSO system. We've known that since July or August. It reached moderate strength in September, and now there's a 95% chance it will develop into a strong El Nino before December, peaking in January and February. When it peaks, and even before then, there's a good chance it'll send strong heat waves toward the poles, triggering strong warming events in the stratosphere and disrupting the jet stream 
and the polar vortex. On one side, we have a strengthening polar vortex. On the other, we have a strengthening El Nino that could disrupt even the strongest polar vortex. I don't know about you, but this feels like a recipe for a freezing disaster. But regardless of the danger, there's a silver lining. The worst effects of a polar vortex collapse are short with really strong cold blizzards and cold spells. The real danger is that it can come quite unexpectedly and there's really not much we can do about it. So be prepared, make sure to have backup, tanks of propane for heating or firewood, whatever you can do to be ready just in case, because you never know. Now, if you wanna really do a deep dive on how the El Nino works, check out this video next.